This video is sponsored by Norpass. More about them later in the video. Precast has been around for a long time and that's because builders prefer it as it takes a lot of the on-site work to off-site and it reduces those costs and construction time on-site, which is extremely critical. And over time, a lot of best practices have been developed behind it. There's some critical aspects to the design of precast that you need to know when considering it your design. So I'll be going through some of those best practices that have been developed over time from the temporary works to the permanent conditions. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Arguably one of the most unique features about precast design is the fact that you need to transport it from site and bring it to the place that it needs to be installed. This leads to a couple of things that you need to consider early on in your design. Like what is the panel breakup? How much can they lift off that truck? Which is gonna be almost unique to every site. But in reality, it's somewhere between five to 10 tons is where the range of that lifting characteristics will be. Another aspect to making sure you're limiting the weight is also the height, as if you go too high, they can't transport it to site. So it's something you need to consider that maybe anything more than about three meters is going to be problematic for site transport, unless you have a unique transport solution. And also with bringing it to site, you've got to realize that you also need to lift it off that truck. So something you may not need to consider, as is typically done by the temporary works engineers, is where those lifting points are going to be. So when you're breaking up those panels, making sure there's good places to put those lifting points so they can lift it and install it on site. One of the most critical things about these lifting points is the fact that you need to make sure you've got tension bars through the whole height of the structure, or at least that panel. You see, because that lifting point needs to lift it up from the top, concrete is no good at tension. So you need to make sure those tension rods are at the bottom of the panel. So when you lift it up, the load is carried from the bottom of the panel and not needing to be taken by the concrete structure, which is typically at a weaker state as it's not its final design strength. The next consideration is how are you gonna prop that wall? Where are those braces gonna be? Typically in precast, as you don't have the floor above it, it's stalled before the floors comes in so you can have a good tie to the floor above you. However, this means that it needs to be temporary braced while this floor above it is being installed and poured before it reaches its design strength. So typically you need to have at least two precast props off every panel, unless there's some other bracing mechanism. When talking about propping and bracing the precast panels, you can do it in two ways. You can either have a diagonal prop going down to the slab, which is the more traditional method. However, this can lead to ugly connections in your slab as you need to have post-fix connections that go in there, especially have that polished concrete or a really clean finished floor. What you can also do if you have enough walls around you can have a horizontal prop going to those elements to brace the structure in that direction. It means that you limit the connections to the floor and may actually lead to a better solution as it actually act in the way that will finally brace the structure out in the end. Instead of having additional strength in those temporary bracing structures to prop that horizontal load. And when you install them, are you gonna have a post-fix solution or a cast-in anchor? Arguably the cast-in anchor probably leads to a nicer, cleaner solution, but it means that you are fixed to a certain location. It means that you need to know exactly where those props need to go. But sometimes based on site constraints, you may not know that. So you may need a post-fix solution. And when considering about a post-fix solution, you wanna make sure that it's installed, meets the design anchorage and can't be undone easily. And this is where things like true bolts are really good as they can come in, you can install them, but also after it, you can post-install and remove it. So meaning that you can leave to a fluff finish after the design is complete and installed properly. In addition to the props, especially on these precast walls, is the fact that you need to put shims underneath. As when you install the precast wall down, you don't want concrete on concrete. As it's grinding, it doesn't lead to a good connection and you don't have a perfectly flush finish. So to make up for that differential, you typically put a grout barrier in there. So you need to carefully design the precast panels for that grout barrier and any load divergence that may occur through there, especially in shiplap joints. But then another thing that you need to worry about, as you can see with that load divergence, is limiting the stress in there, but also the fact that you need to pack it up as that grout doesn't have enough capabilities to resist the compressive loads in its wet state of the precast panel over, all that grout would just squish out. So what does that mean? You need to put a series of shims underneath that wall. Those shims allow you to stack the building up and still allow it to separate, but also allows you to have that temporary state so you can grout it up and let time for that grout to set. The one thing you do need to carefully consider is that load increases. Are those shims harder than the grout around it? Typically, you want to have them less stiff as so when the load comes onto it, they're not attracted to those shims that you put in, but attracted to the grout bed beside it. So when it crushes down, it more likely stresses up on the grout bed than the shim itself. Otherwise, you may have some local area stresses that can cause some local cracking. Careful consideration to also be putting in those shims to make sure the load is evenly balanced and doesn't lead to stress points that your critical areas, especially around dells and other areas like that. The shims is also something that you need to consider is saying, are you 
grouting the bed up as soon as the panel goes down, or are you going to mud around it and grout fill it with liquid grout? If you're doing the latter, you've got to make sure careful consideration about how many floors need to go up before that grout bed joint needs to be grouted and make sure it's not forgotten in the processes during the construction and installation of these precast panels. Sometimes to allow for easier installation of these panels, there may be a different permanent state to the temporary state of installation. Great examples of this is sometimes if you have a spandrel panel coming to a precast panel over, there is two ways that you can do this. You can either step it in so you can get a direct concrete bearing on the side of the panel. This is a really great detail, but leads to a really bad junction, especially externally that the architects may not like. The alternative is to have the precast panel keep going up and sit the precast panel beside it. it. Means that you need to have stitch plates in there to hold that panel in place. But what you don't want to be doing is holding that panel in place while it's on the crane. So an easy way to get around this is to put a little shelf angle on the supporting panel. So it allows you to sit the precast panel on temporarily and gives you time to fix those stitch plates above that will support those permanent actions. Another thing is, do you need critical designs for the footing systems for both either permanent or temporary states? And sometimes because of site constraints, you may need to have temporary footings in there to help you support those precast panels or the base fixities may be fixed for that temporary state. So when looking at those different aspects and saying, is my footing needed to be designed differently for the temporary states or is the permanent states critical? As sometimes you may vary between them. Another good way as well, when you're looking at those permanent and temporary states is as you are stitching the precast panels together, there's design actions of shear, especially when you've got a big shear wall. What you should be trying to do where possible is overlap them like bricks as this allows for a good shear area to go through and not relying on that stitch plate detail that we talked about earlier. Because there's a number of things, a stitch plate detail is soft as it allows for a sliding between them, which then can put additional stress in the slab connection to transfer more of that shear load. So some critical areas around those connections, especially at the slabs, the stitch plates and those dowel jointed connections. Probably the one thing that you got really going for you are those dowel jointed connections for slab connections is the fact that the dowel is in the edge of the slab panel. So there's a distance that slab panel needs to span before the load is taken up in it. This makes it softer. And if it cracks a little bit, it means that it won't take as much load as you're expecting to it. Thank you NordPass for sponsoring this video. NordPass is a business password manager where you can optimize your workflow securely and easily. With NordPass, you don't forget your account resets because your credentials are saved in one secure place just with one click. And you can log in online on accounts seamlessly. Usernames, passwords populate automatically into the login fields wherever they need them. This is handy feature for any team member who often travels or works across multiple different devices. So it can take it anywhere with you. Confidential information can also be saved here securely in one place and accessed and updated when needed. NordPass can also enable assigned logins to digital entry points in different departments or teams so that team members can access across shared credentials and payment information. You live in the digital age, we should be able to protect our data seriously. NordPass can identify data breaches in just one click in a robust scanners that it has on the market. So you can stay focused on matters that are most important to your company. If you want to give NordPass business a try for three months, we have the free trial where you can use with our discount code Brendan Hasty, which also be linked in the below description. Now let's get back to the content. Let's go into more of those best practices in permanent conditions. What was the primary aspect of a precast panel that's built up? Well, it has the precast joint that's dowed together and it has the stitch plates and then it has the direct connection to the slab. There's a number of components here that we need to carefully consider in our designs. We'll start off with the base connection, which is that grouted connection. First up, we're saying that it directly bears, so potentially there's a little bit of divergence, so making sure you're detailing the bottom of the walls correctly to make sure that load is transferred into the structure as needed. The secondary action is those dowel actions. Dowel actions don't need to resist all that vertical sliding force. As you do have a grouted joint, there's friction between it that provides a great resistance to those sliding actions. However, you don't want to be solely reliant upon that grout as that grout can degrade over time or be damaged in a critical event. So you want to make sure you've got some minimal connection of the dowels through that joint to stop some of those sliding actions. I typically take about half, if not more, depending on how critical that joint is. Another critical action of those dowels is the fact that the wall potentially is overturning. So you need to make sure your reinforcement in the dowel connections, especially at each end, are long enough and strong enough to resist any of those lateral actions. So typically you need to have about at least the minimum of what the vertical reinforcement in that wall is through that doweling joint. As typically central, normally means a lot bigger bars in this area to resist those actions. As we're moving up the precast wall, the next connection is those stitch plates. 
So the stitch plates help bind the walls together. So they act more as a giant wall instead of each individual walls, which means it'd be a lot softer. As acting as a giant wall, it reduces your stresses and increases the stiffness of the structure. However, the stitch plates aren't as strong as if you bound it together with a wet stitch. So that means that there is a slight movement in that structure. So you need to carefully consider what those actions are gonna be doing. Typically, it's great modeling practice to model them as two separate walls, but join them together with a couple of stitch plates of equivalent stiffness. This allows you to see what the behavior of the wall is actually gonna do from that reduced stiffness, but also allows you to get the direct forces out that the stitch plates need to be designed for. So it really is a win-win here as you get the direct actions that you need to design stitch plates for, but also makes the building behave more correctly as it is actually intended to do. So you can see those actions that will happen through the slab and other junctions. Talking about slab junctions, so what's the next actions that we need to consider? Is it a slab joint connection? Now this is where it potentially gets a little bit critical as there's a couple of actions that come in here. So the first up, you don't have the precast panel potentially going all the way through and just keying into the side. So there's a dowel jointed connection, making sure that we need to transfer all the load, vertical load through that junction. So there's dowel actions and potentially a little bit of moment induced from that eccentricity. In addition to that, you need to make sure that moment is transferred back into the wall, stabilizing the structure to make sure you've got enough capacity in those dowels coming out of the precast wall. But there's also a secondary action with you can have reduced gravity loads is those lateral forces. In an event such as a big wind event or an earthquake event, you have reduced dead and live loads that that dowling joint needs to be designed for. So the vertical load capacity has been reduced. But what has actually happened is the horizontal load capacity has increased as that horizontal force needs to be pushed into those precast walls for each floor. So you need to look at the differential at each floor. Was the shear force coming in at that location? And do you have enough dowels across that joint to resist those shear actions? Now, this is a combination of both the grinding of the panel together from the stitching together to direct dowel actions. So you need to carefully consider how that joint is behaving to make sure you have enough capacity in these locations. As we're moving up the building, the next critical location, especially for those horizontal connections, is the top of the wall, potentially where you've got a steel structure. Now this may be a slab on ground, such as a standard tilt up single floor, or you've got a steel building over the top, or if you can be even up 20 stories up in the air and still have a steel roof in the top, this will be a similar problem. In the event of a fire, what happens is the heat comes on the inside edge of the panel. This makes this panel bow out, causing additional stress in the steel work over the top. So we want to make sure that that critical connection doesn't fail under these actions. Because what you wanted to do, instead of falling out and squashing anyone that may be outside the building, you want to make sure that it pulls it back into the building during the event of the fire. So how does it do this? Well, the precast panel bows out and you need to make sure you have enough capacity in there. But as the steel starts to degrade, it starts to bend down in continuing actions and pulls that precast panel back in, making it all collapse inwards instead of outwards and squashing the firefighters that may be trying to save your structure. So there is a simple rule of thumb about how you can design for these actions. Well, first up, you've got the precast panel, so you know the direct weight of that. What you do is you tilt it to roughly about 10 degrees, and this gives you an offset load for the actions that you can twist back. From this, you design that top connection for six times that load bending moment to make sure it has enough capacity to pull back. Now, this is only guidance, and depending on what other actions you may need to design for, this load may be even less or even more. So you're making sure you're checking out your local codes about how to design for these certain actions. But it's not something you should miss in your design because it's not there, as these are critical actions and you don't want the people outside the building being squashed in the event of a fire. And if you want to hear more about the detailing of precast structures, I've got two videos linked here that will help you out greatly. If you want to give a pass manager a try, I'd recommend that you try NordPass with my discount code Brendan Hasty, as you get a free month free trial so you can see it in action. If you're interested in this point channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube member through the links below or see links in my description to my Patreon page. Both help support this content. Without the support of my Patreons or YouTube members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.